there are many reasons to love Linux, but from time to time you'll run into something where you're like, I really, really don't like this right now. And I had to deal with two of those problems very recently. So if you don't know, very recently I went and built a new computer. So there was two things I had to deal with. Now this new computer, I don't believe there is a way to set it to legacy BIOS mode within the motherboard. And the second thing is that I actually don't have a way to easily run an ethernet cable to my computer because my modem is sitting outside. It's a long story, but yeah, my modem is outside. So it's through a couple of walls and there's not really a way to run a cable to it. So I've had to deal with UEFI and I've had to deal with Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi I have learnt to deal with, but UEFI was a, it was a new beast to deal with. So let's just go over some of the problems that I have dealing with this. Now, we'll start with Wi-Fi just because that's the first thing you really have to deal with. When you first boot into your, say, Arc installation media, you could probably connect to it just fine. So I connect to it using Wi-Fi menu. That's generally the easiest way to do it. Everything will work straight out of the box. Like even though I've got a, a Broadcom Wi-Fi card, it just worked perfectly. Not a problem whatsoever. I was like, okay, well maybe there's gonna be something there to be a problem when I'm actually doing that, but no. No, not, not a problem there. Went through the entire installation process, got network manager and all that set up, all working fine. Then I boot into the system. Network manager was working perfectly fine when I was on the installation media. Boot into the system, everything breaks. I don't know why, I went back to the installation media, I tried to do it with Wi-Fi menu, wouldn't even bother finding the device, the device was definitely there, I was managing to list it out through another tool, but for whatever reason I just couldn't connect to Wi-Fi. I've never been able to work out what this problem is, I've tried to do it on my laptop when I was installing Arch for the first time on that, and the second time and the third time, I've tried using various different CLI tools, and I've just never been able to get it to work through my terminal. My fix for it though, it, it, it works. It's a bit of a hack, but it works. So what I'll normally do is I'll get network manager set up, get all that like configured and all that, have it so it'll automatically start on boot. And then what I do is my hack. So I run BSPWM right now and I don't believe there is a status bar that's actually available within the standard repos. So what I do instead is I go and install i3 and I'll install something like i3 status or i3 bar, just anything that I can get a status bar working. And then what I'll do is I'll do my hack. So my hack is basically to just get the status bar working, doesn't matter what's in it, except for one thing. I need to have an icon tray. And what I do with the icon tray is I run network manager applet and then it will appear in my top corner up here. So if we just go to my main screen, you'll see up here, we've got my little network manager applet. So what I'll do is I'll just use this thing and let the GUI deal with it. I have no idea why it suddenly starts working when I do it through this. I've followed a bunch of different tutorials to do it through my terminal. None of them have worked. I have no idea why none of them work, but as soon as I do it through this little applet, it just works perfectly. And I don't know why. If someone knows why Wi-Fi is just such a pain like that, then let me know, but I've just never been able to get it working through my terminal. Besides that though, for whatever reason, my Broadcom card wasn't a problem. I thought that because Broadcom devices are generally a bit of a problem, just because they have their proprietary drivers, that it, it's just a bit of a finicky setup to get working. I thought I just wouldn't be able to get Wi-Fi working without installing separate packages. Nope. Just had to do it through my GUI method. What I'm thinking of doing though is getting rid of the Wi-Fi card just because I have had some weird connectivity problems. I don't know if it's a problem with the card, with a, a problem with Linux, or just a problem with the location my system's in. Because I've had a few dropouts from time to time. It also could be a problem with Discord because you'll notice in the recent episodes of the podcast it's been dropping out a bit. I think it might be a Discord problem but it very well could be a Wi-Fi problem as well. So what I'm planning to do because as I said, my modem is currently sitting through a couple of walls in my garage. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get a ethernet over power adapter, just plug it in out there, plug it in down here where my power thingy is, my power, power port, and then just plug in ethernet like that. I've used it in the past. I'm not looking for like really good ping, so it doesn't really matter if that's a bit of a mess. As long as I have a consistent connection, I feel like it's probably gonna be better than what I have right now, but if I can get Wi-Fi actually working consistently, then I'm not gonna bother doing that. I think that'll just be an easier solution though. 
If anyone has any suggestions for how I can deal with the Wi-Fi problem, then feel free to leave them down below. But I've tried a bunch of different tutorials, I've tried a bunch of different commands, a bunch of different programs. None of them have worked except for my GUI hack. Even when I was doing it on my laptop, which is off to the side right here, that has an Intel chipset in it, which plays a bit nicer with Linux, but even that, I had the exact same problem where I had to go and install something like i3 and then just do it through Network Manager Applet just because I don't know what's going on with the terminal. So on that device, I didn't know what the problem was. So I think I spent six or seven hours just trying to get Wi-Fi working. The instant that I installed i3 and installed Network Manager Applet, it just all worked perfectly. So I don't know what the problem with that is, but... As I said earlier, I'm probably just going to get an Ethernet over power adapter and just never deal with Wi-Fi again. That'll probably be the easiest solution. Now, the problem with UEFI is it's not too different from the regular install process with a legacy system. The issue with this is that it lures you into like a false sense of security, basically. It's so close to a regular legacy install that it makes you think that it's not too different. In reality, the changes that you have to make basically make or break whether your system is going to boot. So the first one is you have to change from using a DOS label for your petitions to a GPT label. That's not too difficult. You just change one setting in like FDisk, CFDisk, whatever petition program you want to use. The more complicated part is actually setting up your bootloader. So I'm using Grub. I know there are bootloaders that are made to actually work directly with UEFI and are only made to work with UEFI, but I've done it with Grub just because I've been using Grub this entire time, and it seems like most of the tutorials are about Grub. So I would probably recommend Grub. Maybe someone else is going to tell me that one of the others is better, but I haven't had problems with Grub once I've got it working. The problem, though, is getting it working. Luckily for you, though, I found this video that... And actually, luckily for me as well, I found this video that goes over pretty much the entire install process. The part you're really going to care about is from, like, 16 minutes onwards, and that's pretty much the part that actually changes. So we'll go over things like the extra packages you need to install, like FE VARs, FE Boot Manager, and things like that. And then it goes over how you have to actually change the mount point for your boot petition, because on a legacy system, you just mount it to slash boot. On a UEFI system, you have to mount it to slash boot slash EFI, otherwise your system just won't be able to find it. Then it goes over other things like the command you have to run for grub, which is very specific, and if you make this wrong, it's just not going to work. And then it will go over some more other complicated stuff, like how you have to actually then go copy your grub install into a separate location, because sometimes your system just won't find the grub install. And then you also have to then make a script that will then call that grub install, because sometimes it won't find the backup grub install, but it will find the script instead. So you have to do all this extra stuff just to make sure your system can boot. Some of this stuff is very dependent on the actual motherboard you're using. Like some motherboards will just find that initial installation. Some will find the backup installation. Some won't find either of those and they'll just find the script. So you have to just do all this extra step just to make sure that UEFI is just even going to boot. And I don't think there is any indication on your files that actually come with an EFI system or on like the motherboard's website or anything like this that'll actually indicate whether all of these steps are actually needed. Some motherboards they're needed, some only one of them is needed. But you have to do all of them because you have literally no idea whether they're all needed or not. And if you don't do it like that, then you have to go back and actually set up your grub install again, which is a pain and you don't want to do that. So you're just going to do all of the complicated stuff right at the start and then not worry about the fact that sometimes this is not going to be used because it's much better if it's just not used and it works all the time then you just forgot to do that extra stuff and it just doesn't work. So I would really recommend, unless you have some really important reason to be using a UEFI system, just use Legacy BIOS. I don't think I actually had a choice with my motherboard. On older versions of the ASUS Prime and older versions of the ASUS UEFI, there was a way to switch back to a legacy BIOS, but I think that switch has been removed now, at least on my specific motherboard. I've got a uh, ASUS Prime X570P. I don't think there's a way to switch back to a legacy BIOS, and I haven't actually found one. I couldn't find any reference to it in the manual or on any forum posts online. All of the forum posts I saw were about an older version of the motherboard, or just a different ASUS motherboard in general, which has a very similar looking UEFI interface, but it's just missing that switch. I don't really get the benefit of using UEFI. I know obviously that it supports like bigger hard drives and things like this. I don't know how big hard drives actually. Probably some ludicrously high number like 
some ridiculous amount of petabytes or something like that. But I've never actually had a problem doing any of this stuff with just a legacy BIOS system. I'm I don't know how accurate this is, but it seems like the maximum hard drive size for a BIOS system is 2 terabytes, and my biggest hard drive is 2 terabytes, so I've got my main home drive, which is a 2 terabyte hard drive, and then I've got my boot drive, which is a 512 gigabyte NVMe drive. So I don't really actually have a reason to be on UEFI, except for the fact that I just need to be for this motherboard. So if I was making another purchasing decision, I would go out of my way to find a motherboard that actually still lets me do a BIOS switch. They're getting harder and harder to find just because most motherboard manufacturers are switching entirely to UEFI because Windows doesn't have a problem with UEFI. Other Linux distros don't really have a problem if they do the uh, more graphical installer because the graphical installer will just deal with all that stuff for you, but if you're using one of the minimal installers where you have to actually set up your bootloader yourself, it is a massive pain to do. So I would really recommend trying to avoid that if possible. I see why a lot of people like to run like older ThinkPads where it only has a legacy BIOS and has a bunch of hardware that just has open source drivers or just has drivers that have been worked on for so long that it doesn't really matter anymore if they're proprietary because everyone just knows how they work anyway. So I'm, I'm starting to see why people like the older ThinkPads. I still like my really fast new hardware, so I'm going to have to accept the problems that come along with doing that, like having to deal with UEFI, but I, I see the benefit. I definitely see the benefit, that's for sure. I know there are other benefits that come with using UEFI, like fast boot and other things like this, plus you get this fancy modern looking interface where you can do all these like things and you have mouse support in your UEFI. I don't ever use mouse support because this thing does not play nicely. I think it's just a problem with it being a wireless mouse. I don't know what's going on there, but every time I try to use it within that UEFI screen, it just doesn't work basically. It pretty much just moves really, really slowly. So if I'm trying to, so let's put it on the slower setting. Oh, wrong one. It's even slower than this. It's like this all the time. And I can't really do anything about it no matter how fast I move the mouse it always just moves this slowly. So I don't know what the deal is with that. I'm going to assume it's probably something to do with it being a wireless mouse. It's like a little wireless dongle. It probably doesn't work properly with the UEFI. But none of this stuff in here is really too useful that you couldn't already do with an old BIOS. Like, oh, we have our boot priority here. Like, oh, that's cool. I could do that before. Or it's like there's easy tunes. Like, okay, I guess that's cool. But there's a way to do that within software on your actual system or you have like all of this other stuff. None of this here is stuff that you couldn't already do or you couldn't already do through software on your actual OS. So I don't really see the benefit from that respect either, but I'm sure there's some reason why you'd want to use a UEFI system, but I don't really see the benefit of it for my system. Now I could probably keep this video going for another 10 minutes by just talking about the other thing that I hate on Linux and that is CUPS. So Linux printing was designed and implemented by people working to preserve the rainforest by making it utterly impossible to consume paper. This is the one thing on Harmful Cat V that isn't an absolute joke, but I think I'll save that for a different video. I really, really don't like printing on Linux. I've literally never got it to work. I don't know how to do it. I've tried a bunch of different ways and it just doesn't work. I don't know why. I'm going to assume it's probably a problem with my printer. Don't know. All I know is that some people can print on Linux and I assume it has something to do with buying a very specific printer that you know will work. For whatever reason though, that's a pain as well, but we're not going to keep going on about that. I think we'll just end the video there. So I'm probably going to get that Ethernet over power adapter and test that out because I do want the podcast to get better. I don't like that it's just always cutting out. My other solution that I do want to try out as well is to not use Discord. I'm not sure what I will migrate to. I've tried out Google Hangouts before, but that's also a bit of a mess. At least Google service I can trust to work. Discord, I don't know what's going on with them. I assume they just use Amazon servers, but for whatever reason, it's just always cutting out lately. That also could just be a problem with Discord Canary as well. So yeah, I'm, I'm going to find some solution to not deal with Wi-Fi. I'll probably just sell this Wi-Fi card for like 20 bucks or whatever I can get for it. And then just never look back. Now, UEFI on the other hand, I'm just going to hope and pray that I don't ever have to deal with it again until I basically, until I replace the hard drive really. So I, I don't ever want to have to deal with this again. It's a massive pain. Let's just hope that I'm, I'm good for a while. 
So, I think we'll just end it there, but before I go, I want to thank my patrons. A special thank you goes to Nathan Andrew Road, Tony Oculari, Ray, and Zilver. That actually kind of flows now, and that makes it a bit easier to say. It's going to be a problem when I get another patron, but hey, I'm happy for the support, and if you want to join the Patreon, there'll be a link to my Patreon down below, as well as some other links down there, like my Amazon affiliate links, where you can buy the gear I use in this channel, or just literally anything else you want. Also remember to check out my podcast, which is Tech Over Tea. It's available on YouTube and Library, as well as an audio distribution, just literally anywhere that you can find podcasts. Also remember to smash the like button and leave me a comment down below, and remember to subscribe and ding the bell icon down below as well. So I think that's pretty much everything for me, and I'm out.